Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I oh, appreciate it, Ben. Thanks so much for talking about our case. So I have had to, over the course of my career, explain Chevron to a lot of people. And I always preface it by saying, I'm not a lawyer and I don't even play a lawyer on TV. Uh, so how do you explain Chevron to people generally when they ask you to explain it? Yeah, it, it's a good question. It's a really important part of this case. Um, I remember struggling with it when I learned it in law school, so I'm right there with you, Ben. Um, but the basic explanation is that Chevron is a case from 1984 um, that found that when statutes are ambiguous, and I put ambiguous in, in air quotes there, that the court needs to defer to the agency's interpretation of the statute as long as it's reasonable. And what that's produced is a two-part test. So step one, they, they call it the Chevron two-step. It's not a fun dance in front of a gas station. You know, it's a, um, it's a, you know, the way judges apply it. And they say, all right, step one, is the statute unambiguous? Is it clear? Congress said you can do this or you can't do that or whatever it might be, uh, particularly dealing with grants of authority. Um, and if it is unclear, um, if it is ambiguous according to the court, um, then they go to step two, in which case if the agency's interpretation of the statute is reasonable, they basically automatically win. And you'll be surprised to hear in that a majority of cases when you get to step two, um, the government wins. And, and what has happened over time is that ambiguity is suddenly springing up everywhere. Um, silence is ambiguity now. Anything you want can be ambiguity. And what this has led is to a statutory uh, regula and regulatory review scheme um, that has deferred to federal agencies and puts a thumb on the scale in favor of one litigant, the government, over another, typically a private citizen or small business, whatever it may be, in court. And that's quite offensive to our, our notions of justice in this country. So let's take a step back from that. The idea you know, that I think most Americans have who don't have to deal with situations like this or cases like this is that, well, when we come to the court, we both are on equal footing. We both have a story to tell. We both have each side. We're going to go out there and we're going to battle against each other to maybe determine the way that, you know, certain things are going to happen in ways that could be, you know, really impactful, especially for the small businessman or, uh, you know, the, the small farmer, the small fisherman, et cetera, you know, against the federal government. Give it, you know, meaning that they assume that that government and the bureaucrats involved in it do not have kind of a built-in advantage, uh, you know, a bonus to their side. But Chevron really reverses that. It does not, it, you know, involve an even, an even playing field or, you know, sort of equal partners here. It's almost like, you know, it's playing a Madden game where you've, you're giving boosts to one side of the, of the competition uh, and the other one is just playing with normal players. It doesn't seem fair. How did the court end up in a situation like this in the first place? Yeah, I mean, it, it, when Chevron was first passed in, in, in 1984, it, the, the statute dealt with, with this issue. And over time, um, in application, it just it, it has not worked out. And our, our petition talks a lot about this, that, um, you know, the government, you know, I, as someone who's represented a lot of, of folks, uh, you know, kind of David versus Goliath stories going up against the government, the government already has inherent and built in advantages in having the resources of the federal government. Um, and courts have, have sort of just kind of used Chevron as a way to not engage with the statutory text. Um, and that's, I mean, that's what our, our, our country is founded on the idea that we have a written constitution, we have written laws, we have statutory text, and citizens can rely that the text of the law says what the law is and engage with that, and then enter the administrative state. Mm -hmm. um, that has, you know, over the last few decades uh, metastasized in size and become very large, where Congress has sort of abdicated its responsibility a little bit and allowed the administrative state um, to sort of to, to run amok and create rules and regulations and basically act as lawmakers themselves. And what Chevron allows these administrative agencies to do is to find ambiguity in statutes where, and I'm, you know, in our case here, where, where and I, I can talk more about my clients in a moment, where there's no grant of authority at all, say, well, it's ambiguity. I guess you have to defer to us. Um, and courts are happy to do that. And then the government wins and, and, and the, the citizen or the small business, whoever it might be, on the other end, didn't get a fair shake in court. Tell us about your case and, uh, and your clients.
the situation that they confront that leads us to, you know, p- potentially a momentous decision at the Supreme Court? Yeah, I, I think I think the facts of this case and what my clients have gone through is is probably the best way to illustrate to your audience and to other people why Chevron is harmful, why why that case is harmful. Um, so my clients are an American story. They are herring fishermen out of Cape May, New Jersey. Um, we have a range of different clients. We have clients that, that employ a number of individuals. Uh, we have clients that are, have been fishing for 40 years. We have clients that are third generation fishermen. Uh, fishermen, as you know, you know, fishing can be a family business. It is a family business uh, for our clients, and it's passed down from generation to generation, um, and, and particularly out of Cape May, where the industry uh, comes out of in this case. Um, and there is a statute called the Magnuson-Stevens Act that Congress passed that gives uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Fisheries Service and ultimately Department of Commerce the ability to uh, regulate fishermen, and that's such as setting quotas and other rules and regulations. And one of the things in the statute that Congress did give the authority for, it's discretionary, but uh, the Fisheries Service can require the fishermen to carry monitors on board bar, on board their boats uh, to watch them fish, to basically ensure they are, um, allegedly ensure they are complying with the law. To give you an analogy, it would be like if I said, on your way to work today, we've assigned you a state trooper, um, and he's going to ride in the passenger seat of your car, and he's going to make sure that you don't exceed the speed limit on the way to work, right? Mm-hmm. That's bothersome. I understand I that. I ticket every day. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's in four, just go on 495 in D.C., we'd have tickets left and right. Um, but... Five, you know, it's five miles over. It's five miles over. <laughs> that's right. So anyway, and, right. <laughs> but the statute says the agency has the authority to place these monitors on the boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the agency ran out of money, um, they claim, to pay the monitor salaries that are on the boat. Nothing in the statute says, there's no grant of authority that says the agency may therefore bill the industry for the cost of the monitor. So in our example here, you know, they, they said, you know, the state of, of Virginia says, we, you know, we, we sorry, Commonwealth of Virginia, don't want to get in trouble, says we ran out of money to, um, <laughs> to uh, Thank you. pay the state trooper, you know, Ben, we're going to bill you for his salary for the day as he rides in your car. Um, and they promulgated a rule that said now the industry needs to fund these monitors uh, that ride their boats and watch them fish. So we brought a lawsuit and said, hey, nothing in the statute says you can do this, right? All it says is you can make the monitors ride the boat. And by the way, and the government hasn't pointed to this, and we've never discovered anywhere else in the American system of laws where uh, you know, you've been forced to pay this sort of fee for a monitor without any statutory authority. And to make matters worse, so not to get too complicated in the issue, but the Magnuson-Stevens Act breaks uh, the fisheries up into different geographic areas across the country, right? And when Congress passed, uh, amended the statute, it said North Pacific fishery, uh, we are going to permit, if you want, you know, you can pass fees along to the fishermen there. They're capped. I think you're capped at 2% for that fishery, um, you know, for the cost of monitoring. Foreign fishery, if you're if you're just a foreign fishing boat, oh, you know, if you want to charge them for the monitors, you can do that. There's another program, Limited Access Privilege Program. We're going to, you can charge them too, but it's capped at 3%. So not only did Congress not give the authority for them to impose the monitoring costs on the herring fishery, the fishery here, it actually gave that authority to other fisheries. So you might say, well, if Congress thought it was necessary to delegate this authority to other fisheries, surely they didn't think they were giving a broad delegation for NOAA and for the fishery service to do whatever it wanted. Because if they were, well, then what was the point of delegating the authority elsewhere? And then you think about on top of that, not only that, but when Congress did delegate this authority, they were very sensitive to how costly this could be. And they said, we're going to cap the fees. Well, what NOAA did in our case is the fees are $710 a day. And I think when people think about, they might hear the term commercial fisherman and think, oh, it's a big boat. No, it's not actually. I mean, uh, I I actually have a little bit of experience with this. I used to employ somebody who worked uh, as a commercial fisherman beforehand. Uh, and I had an intern who had previously worked uh, as a commercial fisherman, and they're actually small businesses uh, yep. in, terms, in terms of the way that most of them function. But continue. Yeah, no. It, so it, it's a tough business. It's a, It can be a dangerous business. It's really hard work. I mean, it really is the quintessential American story of small business and of families 
uh, working hard to put food on the table, not only for their own family, but to fish and put food on the table for the rest of the country. $710 a day uh, for a day that when you are selected, and they're not selected every day, but when they're selected for monitoring, could mean that the captain of the boat may actually lose money on the trip because the captain, you know, if you've ever been fishing, if you've ever been hunting, you don't always get something, right? Nope. Um, and if if you don't have the catch that day, um, or even if you do sometimes, the fees can be so high uh, that you can um, not make any money on the trip. And NOAA, the government itself, has admitted that this is going to basically, they use different language, but it's going to be a 20% cut and take back uh, for the fishermen. And anyone that's run a small business knows we're not running with monster margins here, right? You know, 20%, that's a lot of money. Um, and and it can imperil the future of this industry. Um, and we see elsewhere in the statute when Congress did grant this authority, they said, oh, we realize how sensitive this is, right? And that's what they seem to mean by the statute. Sure. Uh, so we're going to cap the fees. Um, and here, this is just can be a potentially economic devastating thing that they have you know, as we as we've argued through the courts, they have no statutory authority to do. So, go ahead, Ben. Sorry. No, no, no. I I think you you've laid out their situation. So draw the thread through to how you end up, how this ends up as a Supreme Court case. Yeah. So we bring suit. Um, you know, obviously Chevron comes up in the briefing, right? The district court. We we talked about Chevron step one before. That's a step that says, is the law unambiguous? Is it clear? The district court said, yes, the law was clear they could do this. It was sort of a, a surprising result. Uh, the D.C. Circuit... Seems like uh, they skipped a step there. Yeah, you know, we, we went up to the D.C. Circuit on appeal. The D.C. Circuit issued a different opinion that said, well, the law is not unambiguous that you can do it. Um, it is ambiguous. Um, basically saying silence is conveying ambiguity here, right? And as we know... Um, you know, agencies are creatures of statute. They are they are grifted with gifted with the authority that Congress chooses to delegate to them. Freudian slip there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 you got yeah, me. Yeah, they, are, um, they are gifted with that tool. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and if Congress doesn't give them authority, then they don't have it. And so, by saying mm -hmm. silence conveys ambiguity, you are, are naturally increasing the authority of an agency, particularly here when it's we're talking about like appropriations power and stuff like this. We don't have the money, so we're gonna we're gonna directly take it um, from the citizenry rather than going through Congress and asking for appropriation. So, the D.C. Circuit says, you know, this is we're going to Chevron Step Two. The law is ambiguous, but because it's ambiguous, we're going to defer to the agency's interpretation of the statute that they have this authority. Judge Walker, it was a two-one decision, so it was not a three-zero. You know, there's three judges on a D.C. Circuit panel. Yeah. Judge Walker dissented and said, you know. He said a lot of things, but he said that, you know, there is no grant of authority here. Chevron can't possibly mean that there is um, ambiguity when there's silence. And by the way, the Supreme Court has stopped using Chevron. Has anyone noticed? Um, there were two cases last year um, that yes. dealt with health care regulation. Not too necessary to get into the details, but one of them, I think, went 5-4. And it yeah, was on they, statutory yeah. interpretation. Yeah. And they, even though it was a close case and the justices split against what the statute said, the court n didn't talk about Chevron. And so Judge Walker says, by the way, the Supreme Court appears to have stopped using this. And the majority panel said, you know, we see what you're saying there. We understand the Supreme Court is doing that, but it's still good law and it's still precedent. We're going to apply it. Mm -hmm. And so we're up at the Supreme Court. We offered the Supreme Court two questions. So when you go up to the Supreme Court, you have a question, two questions presented. One was um, basically, you know, does the statute say they can do this? And the second was, should the court overturn or at least clarify Chevron, particularly when it deals with ambiguity and grants in the statute elsewhere? And the Supreme Court granted review on our case, but limited review only to the second question. So that's really important. The Supreme Court said we're going to discuss whether to clarify um, or overrule Chevron, and that's what's up before the court, and that's where we are now. All right. So – Let's unpack this for the non-lawyer yeah. for the moment. <laughs> Chevron essentially means that the default is to assume that the bureaucrat in front of you is the expert and correct about what ought to happen. And questioning that doctrine in a judiciary manner is to basically say, Maybe we shouldn't just automatically assume 
that bureaucrats are correct, that the experts in the government know what they're talking about more than everything else that's going on around them. Now, in the isolated incident here, you know, this is about the monitoring of fishing boats, of, of, of something that is, uh, you know, as you said, as American as apple pie, you know, this is something that we've been doing. Sam Adams owned a, uh, you know, a freaking, you know, fishery and yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, the, the point is, this is a big deal because what it's, what, what it's really about is saying, we have been operating on uneven footing mm -hmm. for a very long time. And we need to restore an even footing in terms of evaluating the way that these government entities are evaluated in front of courts versus the people who actually do the job. Have I done a good job of summarizing that from your perspective, Eric? Yeah, I think so. And and to illustrate sort of here why it's even more shocking is the defer the de they're deferring here to the experts' view. Well, the I should say. They let you know, as you were calling them, yeah, the yeah, experts, yeah. right? Quote, yeah, you have to on a podcast. You have to you have to say. Yeah, yeah. Experience. I keep forgetting. I'm not. A, you're not gonna have the video here. They're, <laughs> let me rephrase that. Here they're deferring to the agency's view of the power granted to them by the statute, right? So that's yeah. a question of law, right? That's a question of whether Congress delegated them authority to do something. Right? The bureaucrats are saying Congress said that we can basically do this thing and the courts are now having to decide, well, wait a minute, did they actually say that? Or are you just reading into right. what Congress said in order to allow yourself to do the thing you want to do? And it's right. And what a judge is, what judges do is they interpret the law and apply it to the facts before them in the litigation. That is the expertise of a judge looking at a statute. And working through it and saying Congress delegated this authority, Congress didn't delegate this authority. Why would we want anyone but the courts to be making those sorts of interpretations of congressional? Of course, Congress can amend a statute. It can change it later. But Congress passed the statute. It passed. It delegated the authority. It delegated. It withheld the authority. It withheld. Right? Congress doesn't need to go through and say you – like create a laundry list of powers agencies don't have every time it passes a statute. Right? Congress creates powers, and they are assumed to have those powers and those powers only with the agency. And so why should we defer to the agency's interpretation of what authority is granted in the, by the law? Why should a judge not be weighing the facts evenly between both litigants? Or, and I should say the facts, but the law evenly between both litigants. So one of the things that's going to emerge from this, and it's already emerged in terms of the press cover to this, is that, you know, okay – uh, right-wingers, conservatives, libertarians are using a sympathetic case uh, to argue against something that is a beneficial good. Uh, and that in reality, this is about the powers used and exercised by vast big businesses uh, that are going to exploit any kind of uh, you know, re reformation of Chevron or reevaluation of Chevron uh, to their benefit. Why is this not true? Uh, and do the leftists have a point, you know, in the sense that, you know, this is, this is something that is going to be used against a lot of the bugaboos of, uh, you know, current America, you know, at a point where, you know, corporate entities do not have a lot of faith among Americans. And, you know, there are always these fights that happen between bureaucracies and, and these corporate, you know, uh, globalist entities, you know, uh, give us some reassurance that this is not a situation where, you know, uh, the the situation of a fisherman uh, and, uh, you know, even a fisherman conglomerate is being used to achieve something that would just be to the benefit legally, mostly, of vast corporations that are going to use it. I would say... Requiring judges to limit agencies to the authority only delegated them delegated to them by Congress is a benefit to democracy, mm -hmm. right? It's a benefit to the system of separation of powers that our founders created. Well, it's actually, yeah, it's the way that they drew it up. <laughs> right. It's the Congress is a deliberative body, right? They are elected representatives. 
If I don't like what my congressman or congresswoman did, I can vote him or her out of office, right? And then they go and deliberate and they weigh the costs and benefits. So think about the context of this case. They weigh the costs and benefits of monitoring in the North Pacific fishery. They decided to cap it at 2% because any cost above that would be you know, too large. That's what Congress does. So it is a benefit to democracy, to our, our Republican system of government, um, to have Congress be the lawmaking body. And I'll, I'll answer your question another way. I, I know you're a big movie fan, Ben. Have you seen the movie Coda that won Best Picture a couple of years ago? Yes. I have, yes. The movie, <laughs> this, so I sat down to watch this movie, and I, trust me, this is relevant to the question. I sat down to watch this movie. No, 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 it's yeah. directly relevant to the question. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I sat down to watch it with my wife after one best picture, just because I saw one best picture and I had an Apple, free Apple subscription, I said, let's watch it. I didn't know anything about it. And I start watching the movie, and the opening scene is a, you know, one of the opening scenes is a bunch of fishermen, ground fishermen in this case, and we have litigated for ground fishermen earlier, we're litigating for herring fishermen here, talking about industry-funded monitoring, the issue at the core of this case. This is in Hollywood, right? This is a Best Picture winner. And, and you know, cursing and, and talking about how how are we going to survive this? What do you mean? I think they say $800 a day in the movie. How are we going to survive $800 a day? And there's a really striking scene later in the movie where the, you know, the movie's about, is not just about industry-funded monitoring, but it creates sort of the conflict that, that drives, it's a great movie yeah. that drives the narrative in the rest of the movie. <laughs> But the family that's at the core of the movie is sitting around the dinner table saying, how are we going to survive this? And every time there's a bureaucratic decision made in Washington, without the benefit of the political lawmaking process that our founders intended, there is a small business, a small family, an entrepreneur, someone sitting somewhere in the country that is thinking, how am I going to survive this bureaucratic decision? And who do I call to fix this? Whose responsibility is this? And the answer is some bureaucrat in Washington. So my answer to you is, this is the way our Constitution was intended to work. This is the way Congress as a lawmaking body was intended to function. Um, we, you know, statutes say what they mean. Um, and I, I just would continually point back to my clients and the small businesses in this country that in many ways can't afford sometimes to fight these battles, um, can't afford to uh, deal with the regulations. The interim, there was an amicus brief written in our case by a group of fishermen um, who were from the ground fish fishery who have faced, have, one has exited the industry um, as a, role, a result of the regulatory process. Another one is suffering, right? So, um, you know, I think that's my answer. I think, I think watch the movie if you haven't seen it, and, you know, you wouldn't imagine it's a movie, and again, I'm not trying to overplay. It's not a movie at its core about regulatory overreach. But if if you are a a a viewer, a viewer that has the kind of the lens that you and I have been, you will certainly see it as you're watching no, the movie. I mean, we, we've we've seen movies about uh, uh, property rights. We've seen movies about uh, you know uh, regulatory overreach. One one thing that I do want to ask you, uh, you know, just in terms of foreseeing the future. Uh, there is an assumption that, especially in the wake of, of Dobbs and some of the other decisions that have come down, that this decision is going to go in your favor. Um, I I don't know. I mean, you know, we can't, you know, uh, last I checked, they are not allowing me to bet on my Barstool app about whether the outcomes of uh, Supreme Court cases are going to go certain ways i would certainly like that because i think i could make a lot of money there is a website for that but i think it's just for fun yeah yeah <laughs> just for fun fun um <laughs> if the supreme court decides in your favor what are the consequences what are the what's the fallout what are the things that happen that would not have happened before yeah it's it's a difficult question to answer because, like you, I don't want to assume what the outcome in the case is going to be. Um, and the way the questions presented that they accepted, I mean, there's certainly a range of outcomes here. I think the way we phrase it um, in our brief is, you know, should they clarify or should they overturn Chevron? I mean, so it could, it, could it be that it clarifies that silence can't convey agency authority, can convey ambiguity? Could it be that Chevron is overturned? Um, and I don't want to speculate too much on that outcome right now. Uh, but I will say, and I'll speak from my, my clients um, and from their perspective, because they're the ones that are at the heart of this, is that 
a small business in New Jersey, small businessmen in New Jersey are finally going to get a fair shake, you know, on an even playing field before the courts. And if they are so fortunate to, to succeed, an agency overreach and abuse of authority that is imposing a cost on them that the agency has no authority to do will be relieved from them. Um, and it, it's one less thing to sit around the dinner table and worry about. Um, and agencies won't, this agency and perhaps other agencies won't be able to just unilaterally create new laws and regulations out of silence uh, when Congress hasn't delegated them the authority. So I know I didn't directly uh, answer your question there, and I, I, I don't want to speculate as of right now, but I can speak to what how my clients are feeling. And I would encourage you, if you want to hear from them directly, go to causeofaction.org. We have a video about them with some interviews with them. I mean, these are great guys, great families. Um, and, and it really brings – sometimes with administrative law – I've said this to a lot of lawyers I've talked to, and, and I probably did this too at the beginning of our talk. We can get really wrapped up into the esoteric ideas and, and, and the philosophy of administrative law and what the precedent says. And sometimes missed in these conversations are the American families. That's why CODA, in my view, was such a brilliant movie because it put – the face, um, and I think a lot of small businesses around the country can empathize with this, it put a face on the harm, the human impact um, of regulatory overreach. Well, I think you you are speaking to perhaps the only Fox podcast host who is actually, uh, you know, tangled with the federal government. I was very happy to win my uh, NLRB case uh, in front of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, and I wish you the best of luck in terms of confronting uh, both these bureaucrats and a, a legal monstrosity in terms of uh, giving favor to the administrative state over to people who are actually doing the work and who understand what is going on on that ground level or on that sea level in your case. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate so much you taking the time to focus on our case. Happy to talk about it.